Our luncheon speaker, of course, is Professor Blinder, who is the uh, Professor of Economics at Princeton University. He's also the co-founder of Princeton Center for Economic Policy Studies, which he founded in 1990. Dr. Blinder also has served as the Vice Chairman of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve Systems. In this capacity, he represented the Fed at various international meetings and was a member of the Board's Committee on Bank Supervision and Regulation, Consumer and Community Affairs, and Derivative Instruments. Allen also served as a member of President Clinton's original Council of Economic Advisors, where he was in charge of the administration's macroeconomic forecasting and worked extensively on budget, international trade, and health care issues. Dr. Blinder is the author and a co-author of 17 books. He's a frequent columnist for the New York Sunday edition and appears frequently, as my wife reminds me each night, on PBS, CNBC, CNN, Bloomberg, and other outlets. Alan is a member of the Bretton Woods Committee and the Bellagio Group and serves on academic advisory panels for the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and the Hamilton Project. And interestingly, or maybe not interestingly, he is also an elected member of the American Philosophical Society and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So please join with me in welcoming uh, Dr. Blinder. Uh, thank you, Rich. Uh, if you'll bear with me, there can be a lot of coughs and things like that. I, the, the cold that I had uh, thought I got rid of a week ago has come roaring back. I think that was it's a, um, a metaphor for the financial crisis, in fact. Uh, the first slide, uh, as you, yeah, it's pretty big. Uh, you can see, uh, th this is my other metaphor for the financial uh, crisis. This is Humpty Dumpty looking in a pretty precarious position. And uh, as we go over the next few slides, Humpty's going to look worse. Uh, and the reason for that is that it all fell apart. It, you, it's rare in history when you can put an exact date. You can actually even put an exact hour on this one, but I don't know what the hour is. Uh, you can put an exact date on the worsening, not the beginning of the financial crisis, which started a very long time ago, August, uh, and you might even date it earlier than that, uh, of 2007. But from August 2007 until September 15, 2008, the Fed, the Treasury, and others were managing to hold things together uh, with, what did I say here, scotch tape and glue, bailing wire, pick your metaphor. Uh, they were being very opportunistic, very creative, doing all sorts of things nobody imagined they could do before, uh, all with the idea of keeping the whole thing from falling apart. And that lasted until September 15, uh, 2008, when the biggest mistake of this entire crisis by uh, bar none was made, and that was the, mis uh, the decision to let Lehman go into Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Um, and everything fell apart after that. <clears throat> the, the, the failure of Lehman Brothers, or really what I should say, the aftermath of the failure of Lehman Brothers, illustrated in very painful way two principles that people in financial markets and academics have been talking about. Well, the first for a very, very long time, decades and decades, the second for a much shorter time. The first is the so-called too big to fail doctrine. This is a well-known doctrine, although not never precisely defined, that regulators, I used to be one, always denied was not there, but everybody in the markets knew was there. Uh, that, and what it means is there were certain institutions that were too large, and by inference, being too large, being systemically important, to be allowed to fail, and what we really meant by that, Alan Greenspan corrected this the other day, too big to liquidate. Uh, remember, Lehman then was, or was it, I should say, is in the process of being uh, liquidated. <clears throat> so uh, one day in March of 2008, for one reason or another, maybe because it was deemed too big to fail, or maybe because of the second doctrine that I'm coming to shortly, uh, the Federal Reserve decided that Bear Stearns would, could, would not be allowed to fail, even though that meant putting something like $30 billion of taxpayer money at risk to prevent it. 
Uh, that seemed, that was a little bit surprising, but vaguely consistent with the too big to fail doctrine. The surprising part was, first of all, it was a bank, and it was the Federal Reserve doing it. But secondly, it wasn't so obvious that Bear Stearns, the fifth largest uh, broker dealer, securities house, was actually too big to fail. It was a kind of a borderline case, whereas everybody would have thought that the big four, the so-called bulge bracket firms, were too big to fail. So Bear Stearns sitting on the borderline, apparently, and the Fed did not let it uh, fail uh, and had to do some unprecedented things. So we come to September 15th, and uh, Lehman Brothers is treated very differently. Uh, what This did two things, I think, that were extremely damaging, extremely damaging. By the way, I'd like to blame this on the Treasury, not the Federal Reserve, as a former vice chairman of the Federal Reserve. So let's, let's be clear about that. Uh, let's also be clear that I was not in the room when the decision was made. Uh, first of all, very, very damaging. This destroyed the rules of the game. As you heard in the last panel, uh, Wall Street is about greed, period, full stop, making money. Wall Streeters are marvelously adaptable and clever people, and they can adapt to virtually any rules. And they can figure out how to make money under almost any rules that you can imagine. But when the rules change suddenly and abruptly and in puzzling ways so that nobody knows what the new rules are, markets tend to go into tizzies. And that's what happened when people started scratching their head and saying, what could be the rule book under which Bear Stearns is too big, or in two lines down, two, coming up on the slide, too entangled to fail, but Lehman Brothers is not? Ponder that question. I pondered it many, many times. I've never been able to come up with an answer. I've never heard a coherent answer offered by anybody. So the rules of the game were destroyed. The analogy that came to my mind immediately was what happened in August of 1998 when Russia, uh, a sovereign nation, defaulted on debt denominated in its own currency. Up until then, my textbook and every textbook said, you never need fear a nation defaulting on uh, debt denominated in its own currency because in the worst case it can always print the currency. You only worry about foreign denominated debt, that Mexico might not have enough dollars to pay its dollar obligation, but always had enough pesos. Uh, and of course Mexico, Mexico did not default on its peso denominated debt. The Russians, for whatever reasons, decided that it was a great idea to default on their ruble denominated debt. That was the event that made the markets go completely nuts in August uh, 1998 for exactly this reason. They thought they knew the rules of the game. All of a sudden, they don't know the rules of the game any longer. So that, coming back to Lehman, that was a fateful decision. One uh, immediate application of that is that perceived counterparty risk just soared all over the world. If Lehman was a lousy counterparty because it was not protected by too big to fail, what about everything else? Or was there any? Harkening back to what was being said before, was there anyone who actually had a AAA credit rating other than the Treasury, U.S. Treasury? And in fact, even credit default swaps on U.S. Treasury started to open up, which is a ridiculous idea. We can, after all, print the dollars. And we're printing them. The second principle that was illustrated in a very painful way is the newer too entangled to fail doctrine. The too entangled to fail doctrine really uh, initiated in the case of long-term credit management back in 1998. That was the one that was tied to Russia. Went into dormancy, basically, until Bear Stearns. The rationale that was given for saving Bear Stearns was not that it was too big to fail, but that it was in too entangled to fail. And by the way, that mostly meant they were entangled with lots of counterparties, but it mostly meant too entangled with hedge funds, for which it was a clearing broker. Other things too, but especially the hedge fund. But anyway, Bear Stearns was being too entangled to fail, and that was the explicit rationale, more or less, given by the Federal Reserve at the time for stopping the failure and participating in the arranged marriage into uh, uh, J.P. Morgan. 
Now, when the two and so the two and it was it was decided for reasons I will never understand that Lehman was not too entangled to fail. That was shown wrong within hours because we had an immediate infection to the money market MMMFs, money market mutual funds. Uh, immediate with, within hours. Within hours of that, that was infecting the commercial paper markets because the money market mutual funds were the principal buyers of the commercial paper. So the contagion now spread to uh, two entirely different uh, and industries that had not really been involved in the chaos up to then. I wouldn't say it was had been contained to the mortgage finance sector up to September 15th. That's really not true. But it had not really affected money market mutual funds until the reserve broke the buck. That's the expression for telling its shareholders, it says this share is worth $1.00, dollars. sorry, it's worth $0.97. Dollars. That had never before happened to a retail money market mutual fund in the history of the industry. That shook cap confidence uh, tremendously, and pretty soon there was a run on money market mutual funds, which led to a collapse of the commercial uh, paper market, illustrating very graphically that Lehman was much too entangled to be allowed to fail. And after Lehman, as I suggested before, the panic spread almost everywhere. Once, once this had happened, the view was, well, there must be no institution that's either too big or too entangled to fail. And so everybody is at risk. Everything is at risk. And, every, and uh, lots of people in the financial markets grabbed the cash and dumped under the mattress, which is not a good recipe for running markets. In addition to that, the knock-on effects of all this brought the con crisis very graphically from Wall Street to Main Street. Until September 15th, the man and woman on the street were looking at this as a bunch of queer events done by rich people that they had no understanding of whatsoever, but they knew it was bad. Uh, shortly after Lehman, in the weeks, days and weeks after Lehman, uh, it, it started to come to Main Street with the, uh, you can call it failure or swallowing up, whatever term you want to use, the disappearance. Well, that's not right, of course, because the, the deals have not closed. They're still there. Let's call it the failures. That's more or less what they were. Of Washington Mutual, the largest thrift institution in the United States by far, and Wachovia, which I think at the time was the fourth largest bank in America. These are institutions that are known by John and Jane Doe because they bank there. They have millions of customers. They have thousands of offices all over the United States. You can't live in America for very long without walking by a WAMU or a Wachovia office. Uh, and you can live almost your whole life without walking by Lehman Brothers. So at least if you divert your eyes when you're around Times Square, don't look up. Uh, uh, other than that, you'll never see a Lehman sign anywhere. But you will see Wachovia and, uh, and Wamu. These are two banks, by the way, a small personal finance confession that I told my extremely risk-averse mother in California she didn't have to worry about failing because they were too big to fail. I used to believe in that uh, doctrine. So as I said, the crisis when retail became very visible. In addition to that, at this point, the stock market started tanking, as everybody in this room knows. And like it or not, the Dow Jones Industrial Average is essentially the only closely watched financial statistic in America by the mass public. A lot of us economists think it's not very important. Uh, but in terms of the mass public, this is the meter of the economy and the meter started registering down, down, down. And that gets reported on the nightly news every night on every network. In addition, it spread to Europe, and as it says there, and elsewhere, to the emerging markets. And dominoes started falling there, too. These are pictures of two of the dominoes, Fortis and Hypo, Hypo Real Estate in Germany. Turned out, as you might have heard in the first panel, I'm sorry I wasn't there, that rough something like 50% of these dodgy U.S. mortgage assets are believed to be held outside the United States in institutions like these and many, many others. In addition, Europe has had its own housing bubbles. 
Those are a few countries where there have been big ones, uh, uh, bigger than in the United States, actually. Um, <clears throat> and so the contagion spread in a much more serious way to Europe, where the authorities had been, by and large, there are exceptions to this, so I don't want to make this a blanket accusation, but by and large, sticking their heads firmly into the sand and saying, this is Europe, that's the stupid Americans. Uh, well, it turns out there were as many stupid Europeans as there were stupid Americans. Uh, and only recently have the European Central Banks woken up to the seriousness of the problem that's on their hands. And just yesterday, the Bank of England cut its interest rate by a point and a half, 150 basis points in one fell swoop, which is uh, un unheard of, uh, basically. And even the ECB cut, even the ECB. Uh, and in addition, I don't have anything on the slide, it was shortly after Lehman that this contagion started hitting the emerging markets. Uh, they had been more or less immune to the whole thing. This 50% of dodgy U.S. mortgage assets were not really held in Hungary and Indonesia and places like that. Uh, but at this point, the contagion was everywhere. And uh, nobody thought that Hungary was a AAA credit. So the result of this is by some date in early October, you can pick your date. I like to pick the 10th of October, but it doesn't matter. The 10th of October is the date on which the LIBOR spread maximized at its worst. And, and by the way, on this, big is bad. Uh, so it hit its maximum on October 10th, but not, the exact date doesn't matter. By then, Humpty Dumpty was looking like this uh, slide. Now, in the nursery rhyme, this is where all the king's horses and all the king's men come in. Or they better come in. So that's what I want to talk about, all the king's horses and all the king's men. Uh, sticking to the United States. So who are these horses and men? First of all, the Federal Reserve. So what did the Federal Reserve do? Well, not very much, uh, except create an alphabet soup of lending facilities. Or I should have said first, uh, immediately, within hours of Lehman's uh, filing for Chapter 11, the Fed essentially nationalized AIG. I heard someone before use some different term for that. It was essentially a nationalization of AIG. The uh, Federal Reserve now holds options on 79.9. David, there's some reason that isn't 80, I think. There's some legal reason why it isn't 80. Uh, but in round numbers, 80% of the common stock of uh, AIG. They have lent AIG a horrendous amount of money and continue to lend more. That happened immediately. Uh, on October 8th, I put an exclamation point after that. The Federal Reserve, in concert with a whole list of other central banks, all lowered interest rates together, which is a remarkable achievement. I can barely imagine the amount of effort and cajoling this took by Ben Bernanke to get these other central banks to go along. It was a crowning signal, barely believable achievement. It had no effect on the markets at all. <laughs> Amazing. I was amazed by that. And the Fed just recently, last week, followed with another 50 basis point cut, bringing the federal funds rate down to 1%, uh, as you know. Uh, when I started, before I looked at the order on the slide, the Fed is now lending to everybody it can find uh, in gigantic volumes. Um, uh, so much so that lately the federal funds rate has been consistently below the target. The target was one and a half until about a week ago. Now it's one. And for almost every day of the last some weeks, I'm not sure Erica will know exactly, uh, Fed funds have actually been below. What does that mean? Money is being pumped out of New York uh, into the, uh, out of the New York Fed into the financial uh, system. A question which we might come back to uh, later if anybody wants to is whether this is, this, all this money pumping is creating the seeds of a future inflation problem. Uh, I mentioned before that countries are not supposed to default on their own debt. The reason that they don't is they can always inflate their way out of the debt. Uh, I don't think that's the solution that we're going to use in the United States, and the bond market certainly doesn't think that either, because you can just look at the pricing of long-term bonds. But there are some voices raising this as a potential future, not present uh, issue. 
Uh, the last episode in this Fed buying spree is, is what the Fed is doing right now, probably literally right now, uh, is buying up commercial paper, including the paper of industrial companies. Not banks, not insurance. Well, they're doing that too. Uh, but not just banks, not just insurance companies, but industrial companies. And I have no idea how much General Motors paper the Federal Reserve uh, owns now, but it sure isn't the AAA credit. Last bullet on this page says, who knows what's next? I don't know. What I do know, or what I, so first of all, what I believe is that something is next. This is not over. Uh, and what I know is that Ben Bernanke is not going to say, sorry, folks, we've done everything we can. We're now closed for business. Don't apply for money. That's not going to happen. He's made that abundantly clear. So if any of you need some money, uh, <laughs> send him an email. Uh, second King's Horses and King's Men is the United States Treasury, and I'm going to focus here on the TARP because that is the main thing that the Treasury is doing. Uh, I'd like to remind you all, or maybe it's not remind, I don't know how close attention everybody here is paying, but for those of you who have been paying attention, I want to remind you that the TARP was authorized, you can read the act, for three purposes. The $700 billion was authorized for three purposes. One, buying and refinancing mortgages for a pretty obvious reason, which I think you probably heard a lot about from Mark and Erica and David uh, earlier. We're facing a potential tsunami of foreclosures in America. Foreclosures destroy values. They cause fire sales of prices uh, of homes, which depress prices further, which lead to more foreclosures, and so on. There's a very good reason for the government at this point to be buying and refinancing mortgages. Or alternative, the other way you can do it is slap an FHA guarantee or some other kind of guarantee. So you can think of that as a, as a substitute for buying. Um, uh, in case you didn't know, the amount of top money that has been allocated to that purpose so far, zero. Secondly, the name. TARP stands for Troubled Assets Relief Program. The troubled assets, it says in the law, are mortgage-related securities. Actually, it says mortgage-related assets, like it says here, even if they're not securities. Uh, there's very little market in these things these days. Um, things with face value of 100 are selling at 20, if they're selling at all. Uh, and the, um, the sales pitch that was made to the United States Congress to get them to pass this bill was that the money was going to be used for this purpose, purpose number two. Uh, do you know how much money has been used for that purpose so far? Zero. Right. So something strange is going on here, assuming we're a democracy. Uh, third purpose. This I want to, I put down the exact words that are in the law because I want you to read it because they are breathtaking. Uh, to buy any other financial instrument that the secretary, well, at least he has to ask somebody, after consulting with the chairman, with the chairman of the Fed, I think the exact words are Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System, determines the purchase of which is necessary to promote financial market stability. Anything. As long as one person decides it's important for financial stability and the other person has been consulted, doesn't even say he has to agree, uh, uh, read, uh, that's why I put the words. This is what the law says. The Secretary of the Treasury, on his sole authority and without asking anybody else, can buy it. It's a breathtaking, almost unbelievable. In fact, it is, it's unbelievable in the sense, if you would ask me a year ago, would Congress ever pass language like that, I'd say impossible. Impossible. But many impossible things would happen. Number three is the basis on which all the top money expended to date, which is something around 200 billion-ish, heading up to 250, uh, was expended to make capital injections into banks, basically in the form of preferred stock. So let's take up this number three. That's a bank. Unfortunately, all of them don't look that good. Uh, a remarkable feature of this, I believe, to me, is that the capital injections have had essentially no strings attached to them. I would have thought 
that if the government starts handing out equity to private institutions, whatever they are, you know, banks, automakers, anything, um, there would be some, some public purpose strings attached. Because after all, I think the government is not just a hedge fund trying to make money on its investments, but is actually trying to fulfill some public purpose. At least that's my vision of government, or it used to be. Uh, a few notable features of these injections is, first of all, it's extremely cheap capital. It is very easy, thank heaven for Warren Buffett, he made the same sort of deal with Goldman Sachs, which is a better credit than almost everybody else on the top list. Probably They are on the top list also, but they must be the best credit on the list. Uh, and we can compare the Buffett deal with the Paulson deal, and there's no comparison. Uh, Buffett got much tougher terms out of Goldman Sachs in a voluntary transaction. This was not the government with the power of the state pinning you to the wall saying you must do that. They could have said no to Warren Buffett if they thought the terms were adverse to the company. They said yes, uh, and yet we, the taxpayer, are now lending Goldman Sachs and many, many other banks uh, money on those sorts of terms. If you get the idea that I don't think the government got the best possible deal, uh, you are right. The banks are allowed to continue paying dividends or use the money to make acquisitions. Uh, uh, rather than uh, more lending, which I guess I thought was the purpose of infusing more capital into uh, banks. Uh, well, that, yeah, no lending, as I said. Uh, in addition to this, uh, as was highly publicized, uh, the Secretary of the Treasury in a famous meeting in Washington essentially forced the money down the throats of several of these banks that really didn't want it, su such as J.P. Morgan Chase. In order, I think, I'm trying to think what possible reason could you have for doing this, and I think the only possible reason is to avoid stigma. You show that all the best guys took the money, and therefore you worst guys can also take the money without showing everybody that you're a worse guy. Well, if you believe that, you'll believe anything, because uh, instantly at the end of the meeting, the banks that didn't want the money leaked to the press that they were fighting this money. And they didn't want it at all. They didn't need it. So everybody knew this within minutes of the end of the uh, meeting. So put that down again in the list of silly ideas. Now I come to the good news. The Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Thank heaven for the FDIC. Uh, well, actually, it starts. The good news is how the FDIC has behaved. The bad news is that the FDIC was short on funds even before Lehman Day. Uh, there is a legal requirement that the FDIC is supposed to hold one and a quarter percent reserves of, it's an insurance company, remember. So its reserves have to be one and a quarter percent of insured deposits, and they were not before Lehman Day. That, that, that already implies a legal requirement on the FDIC to raise premiums, and the FDIC recently circulated a proposed rule to do so. That's out now for comment by the banks. Right at, right at this minute. On top of that, so remember, they start a little bit behind the eight ball. The FDIC is now insuring deposits between 100000 and 250000 uh, and that will require more revenue into the fund. That is not, that additional revenue is not accounted for by the proposed rule of, for raising premiums that was circulated uh, prior, so they'll need more. Uh, they're also a charge insuring business checking accounts in unlimited amounts. So it's not just 250K, any amount. They're charging a 10 basis point premium on that. Who knows if that's the right number? It looks a little low to me. But, but this is brand new and they're making this up as they go. And in addition, under a legal authority that eludes me, I haven't actually taken this to a, an expert banking lawyer. I just can't imagine the legal authority that they've used to ensure some sort of forms of bank debentures. Not deposits. Uh, they've done it. Whether they have the legal authority to do it, I don't know. Now, on top of that, there have been suggestions rejected by Chairwoman Baer that the FDIC should just insure every single dollar in every bank account uh, in America. Uh, this is a very bad policy idea. It would induce gigantic money flows both inside the United States and across national borders. This was illustrated 
by the mistake the Treasury made, I'm going to say on September 19th, I'm not sure I have the exact date, when they announced that they were insuring all the money in money market mutual funds in reaction to the panic over the money market mutual funds. You again might ask what legal authority did they have to do that? The answer is they didn't, uh, but they did it anyway. Uh, within three hours, uh, I make up the number three because I don't remember the time of day, uh, the representatives of all the banks of Amer in America were down at the Treasury saying, what in the world did you just do to us? You have now told the money market mutual fund in depositors in the money market mutual fund industry that they're insured up to infinity, and in a bank they're insured up to $100,000. Are you crazy? They were. So I think they said, after that they said, oh, I think we were crazy, and they changed it by uh, putting a, uh, um, a time limit. They only insured the deposits in the money market mutual funds that were in there by September 19th. So you couldn't just take all your money out of banks and put it into money market uh, mutual funds. This is an illustration of the kinds of flows you can cause by playing with these uh, parameters. And the same thing is true across countries. When Germany did this, Denmark had to do it. Otherwise, their banks would have all died. If the United States does it, I wouldn't want to be in Canada or Mexico or almost any other country running a bank if the United States were to do that. In addition, of course, banks will have to have to pay higher premium, and there are lots of moral hazard issues that uh, people that have been hostile to deposit insurance have been raising for generations. I always laugh them off. At a level of $100,000, they're ludicrous. At a level of a billion dollars, they're not ludicrous. We'll just leave it at that. Now, what I said about the good news of the FDIC is there's really been only one place to run to for safety in this uh, storm, and that's the insurance uh, provided by the FDIC through the banking system. This second bullet point is what I just mentioned uh, before about undermining that pillar for a few days in September, then correcting it. You will have noted that Merrill Lynch jumped into the arms of Bank of America for safety, and Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley decided they were banks. How many deposits do they hold? Oh, never mind. <laughs> but anyway, that was the life preserver for Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, the FDIC, uh, and the Fed. So this leads me to a conclusion that I can't emphasize enough, that we must never, ever, ever, ever do anything that raises doubts about the ability of the FDIC to make good on its commitments. It is now the only thing that's holding up the ship to the extent that the ship is ho holding at all. Well, meanwhile, back to the economy, or about the economy. Uh, I believe by no coincidence, so this is an arguable point, the economy also looks like it fell off a cliff on Lehman Day. You can't date the economy to the day. Financial markets you can date to the day and sometimes to the minute because of the data. Economies you can't date to the day, but we can date it to the month, and it fell off a cliff in September. September retail sales were horrible. October's are certainly going to be worse, I believe much worse. Uh, job losses leaped. We've been losing jobs all through the years. They leaped in September and October. Uh, more than double, I think. Is that right? Yeah, the average rate of job loss. Something between doubled and tripled. If you, if you compare January through August to September, October, it's something like a tripling, roughly. Is that right, Eric? I think so. Yeah. Yes, there was a huge revision in September, almost doubling the estimated job loss. So uh, this got much, much worse uh, just exactly in September. Uh, up until now, for about the last two years, a curious thing has been happening in the GDP accounts. For those of you who watch the GDP accounts closely, that's about three people in this room, probably. Uh, the growth of net exports has almost been a perfect offset to the sagging of the housing market. Exports have been doing well, housing has been doing terribly, and the numbers almost match up. Well, uh, and that's what I mean by exports have been saving us up to now. But now we're looking at Europe, Japan, and the dot, dot, dot means every other country in the world, essentially, slipping into the direction that we're going. It is unrealistic for the United States of America to think that exports are going to keep bailing us out. 
as go as we go forward, uh, even though they've done it as we, uh, if you look back, housing continues to crumble, as you all know and heard before. And we are now in a recession for sure. The only question is how deep and how long. And my belief is deep and long. Some of the key risk factors for the U.S. economy right now. First, fixing this financial mess, whose character seems to change uh, daily. Uh, uh, as those of you who have been looking at your Blackberries know, uh, the New York Stock Exchange suspended for, I think it was an hour, trading in General Motors stock today. Uh, something I never thought I would see in my lifetime. But it's only the 58th thing in this crisis that I never thought I'd see in my lifetime. <laughs> Uh, to happen, and the point of that is there will be a 59th. Uh, nobody yet knows where house prices, or for that matter, stock prices, will bottom out. We're certainly not at the bottom. Well, I don't want to say certainly, but it seems unlikely we're at the bottom in either uh, one of those, although who knows, by the time the stock exchange closes today, we might be at the bottom. Uh, I already covered this point that we can't rely on exports. And here's a point that you just, it's an obvious point that you hardly ever hear mentioned. The crisis is now changing character in the following way. Up to now, oddly for U.S. business cycles, it's been events in the credit market that have started to drag the economy down. In every business cycle, when the economy goes into recession, it drags the credit market down by turning good loans into bad loans. As you no doubt heard in the first session, a lot of bad mortgage loans were written. Uh, but also a lot of good loans were written, and some of those are going to turn out to be bad loans because of the uh, poor economic performance. So this is a very horrible sort of vicious cycle. The only good news on the economic front is oil prices. Uh, that's looking great right now for an oil importing uh, nation, and that, we shouldn't forget, is a very big stimulus. Given the amount of oil that we import, if the price of oil falls from $140 a barrel to $60 a barrel, that's a nice dollop of purchasing power put right back into the pockets of American consumers and businesses. Okay, quickly. Uh, what do we need now? We are still in the EMS stage. That's if you can't see it, that's the first aid and rescue squad. So these are the people that go to the scene of the accident and try to stop the bleeding and set the broken bones. The next slide is going to be later you then get the person to the hospital and you stop performing the surgery. Uh, but my Uber message, so to speak, is we are in the EMS stage. We need to concentrate on that for now, and we're going to be in it for a while. So. Uh, job number one is to stem the panic, and the Federal Reserve and the Treasury, of course, have been working night and day, literally, on that. Decide what the TARP will do. I talked about the TARP substantially before, and actually get it going, get it done. Uh, as you can tell from what I said, I think the TARP is off to a bad start and badly needs fixing. Uh, well, that's one man's opinion. Well, I'm not the only one. Fannie and Freddie have also been nationalized. I didn't mention that. Uh, it's crucial that whatever you think of Fannie and Freddie in the long run, that's the surgical ward, they have to be kept doing business as usual, exactly as they have in the recent weeks. Uh, that includes buying mortgage-backed securities. They're practically the only buyers uh, out there. And reform can and has to wait. This is an interim solution for Fannie and Freddie. We're not going to keep them that way forever. Choices need to be made. I'll come back to that in a second, uh, but that's for later. The key question to me continues to be, when will private money uh, sensing bargains come rushing in and buying MBS and other things like that, maybe even bank stocks? Uh, the people you should be rooting for, if you're watching this soap opera unfold and you're waiting to see who's coming into the room next, Root for the vultures and bottom fishers. Uh, those are the people that we need. The answer to the question, when will they arrive up to now, has been not yet, unfortunately. And we really need these people. 
Once we're over this, uh, there are a number of reforms that are needed over a longer time frame. I, I, just putting up a few bullet points to do justice to this would take an entire lecture and 22 slides, but I'm just going to hit a, a small number of things. I already mentioned Fannie and Freddie. Fannie and Freddie had this weird hybrid structure. It was government. No, it wasn't government. Uh, it was a private company with a lot of government influence uh, over it and an implicit line of credit from the Treasury. Fannie and Freddie need to go to, in my view, one of the two extremes. And maybe we'll do both. Fully public institution, no question that has private stockholders or anything like that, or perfectly private company with no special claim on the Treasury. It is possible to do both, two entities. One that looks like Ginny Mae and one that looks like a perfectly private company. We need to do something like that um, later. Uh, as has been remarked by many, the regulatory apparatus has been shown to be totally inadequate to the modern financial system, and it needs uh, to catch up a bit. I would just put two side points under that, which seem to be getting less emphasis in, under this general heading, which is that one of the roots of this problem is that there never was a national mortgage regulator, and we need to have a national mortgage regulator. And secondly, that consumer protection was shown to be totally inadequate. Uh, a good question is where to lodge that authority. The question which comes down to in the Fed or not in the Fed, uh, basically. I don't want to get into that now. Uh, this next may be a, may be a uh, moot point because the big four aren't, in fact, the whole big five are gone. So I believe there's no, no, there are no securities houses any longer that are systemically important. <coughs> Excuse me. If you believe that Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley are banks. So at least legally, investment ban I banks here, investment banks are now banks. That means they need to operate with less leverage. This comes right back to the presentation that we had uh, before lunch. If you operate a company with less leverage, you're going to have less profits. A typical uh, American bank that's in good shape earns base about 1% on assets, which translates to 10 to 12% on capital, because it has leverage of 10, 11, 12. That's the sort of standard bank. A bank that does that is doing fine. It's just it's doing fine. These I-banks, as you know, had gotten used to operating on 25, 30, 35 to 1 uh, leverage. Uh, if markets are going up, you can do very well on 35 to 1 leverage. Uh, if markets go down 3%, you have negative net worth. Uh, those days are over. Similarly, I believe it's very important that the regulatory community and the legislature, because I think some of this may take law, push the financial system in a variety of ways toward less complicated, more plain vanilla securities and derivatives that can be traded on organized exchanges. Uh, and as Christopher Taylor mentioned earlier, that means they will be less profitable. The profitability came out of the mystery. If Investment Bank A offered you this unintelligible a derivative, you couldn't shop it to Investment Bank B to get a comparison price. On a plain vanilla fixed floating interest rate swap, you can get quotes all over the place. So the way markets work, the profits get squeezed out of things that can be commoditized, and the investment bankers, of course, want to fight that. Well, we have to make that a hard fight. That's the Cayman Islands. Well, a likely implication of these last two points, the last two points both led to less profitability. A likely implication of those two points is that trading activities and other activities are very likely to migrate, even more than they have today, to hedge funds. Because the hedge funds will not have to cope with the banking regulations uh, and <coughs> that uh, the banks do and indeed can get away from most regulations. Most of these hedge funds are incorporated in the uh, Cayman Islands. 
Some of you may not know that the population of the Cayman Islands is 100 million. <laughs> not really. But if you count post office boxes, you would think uh, it's about 100 million. Uh, and it's going to go from 100, I make up the number 100 million, of course. Uh, it's going to be bigger because more and more uh, activity is going to go there. And they're pretty small islands, actually. So the next, next big regulatory issue is going to be how, not whether, to regulate hedge funds. The regulators are going to be forced to uh, open their eyes to what's happening in hedge funds. Those of you who follow this industry may remember that Bill Donaldson, the head of the SEC, was essentially pilloried and slaughtered for proposing a rule that would essentially make the hedge funds give their name, rank, and serial number. We want your address and phone number, basically. That was considered such an egregious infringement on market freedom that this, the head of the SEC should be thrown out of office uh, for that. Uh, that was one of the minor tragedies of, of the lead up to this uh, crisis. We did not get a better SEC as a result. Um, by the way, while I have this slide, and then I will wrap up, uh, this is the Cayman Islands are a British territory. This is a terrific example of the generic need that many people are now talking about. In fact, there's a summit in Washington in about a week for greater international cooperation on supervision and regulation. Anglophile that I am, I love Britain. I won't, no, I, just, I love Britain. <laughs> the British have been totally uncooperative for decades about reining in. It's not an accident that this stuff is in the Cayman Islands and Bermuda and other places like that. And, and if we don't get the British to cooperate more on bank, on financial supervision and regulation, we're not going to be able to solve this problem. Uh, I think they've been badly burned and maybe their attitudes are changing, but have changed or are changing. Uh, but uh, they've been a part of the problem, not part of the solution up to now. Quickly, an oft forgotten point about political timing. You all remember that we just uh, elected a new president. Uh, what you're probably not thinking about is that a tr the transition lasts 70 odd days and it's very hard to get anything major, long term, structural done during a transition uh, period. Okay, so the new president becomes president on January 20th. And I just want to suggest that long-term financial reform issues might not immediately surface to the top of President Obama's agenda. Like, you know, what to do about auction rate securities. It's just possible that he'll pay more attention to Afghanistan and Iraq than that. Probably not, but uh, he will have a few other things on his mind. So I don't think that these long-run things, the things that I characterized as uh, the surgical ward, are going to be rising to the top of the new president's agenda, which means that we're going to remain in the EMS stage, applying tourniquets and band-aids for a while yet. Summarize very just a few points by way of summary. The economic outlook looks dim and seems to be darkening by the week. Uh, it looks like we're headed for a deep, long recession. To my mind, the way you should think of the recession fighting measures that are either being taken now or being talked about is to try to hold the line at 8% unemployment. I think given what's already happened, if we can get out of this with never seeing an eight handle on the unemployment rate, that will be a great outcome. I doubt that we could achieve it. I fully expect to see unemployment ahead uh, north of 8% nationally. Uh, as I've emphasized, there are still large financial hazards to be navigated. There's a lot of things that have been started and we need to execute on them, not the least of which is the TARP. And finally, uh, we're now in this, uh, was it Sarah Palin or John McCain that said we were doing socialism uh, in America? She was actually right, uh, but not because of progressive taxation. I never thought of that as uh, a deep part of socialism. but. Uh, ownership of businesses by the national government is socialism. 
and the Fed and the Treasury are now backstopping, uh, essentially backstopping the entire financial system with only minor uh, exceptions. Uh, and that cannot remain, and there's going to be a lot of work that uh, for the next administration in getting out from under that uh, situation. Thank you very much. We have about 15 minutes for questions, if that's all right with you, Alan. It's fine. Our next speaker is here, but uh, feel free to ask uh, Professor Blinder questions related to this uh, exciting presentation or depressing, either one. Yes, sir. I think there's a mic for you right there. It seems like the, the credibility of the next Treasury Secretary is going to be absolutely critical. Uh, do we have some folks on that? that do we have that? Hold it close to your mouth. Yeah, do we have some folks that can fill that role, that have that broad shoulder? The, the question is that do we have folks that can uh, uh, fill the shoes of the job of the next Treasury uh, Secretary that have the credibility among uh, other things? I think the answer is yes. I think there are several uh, good candidates. The names have been widely discussed in the uh, media. And if, you, uh, if you listen to NPR yesterday morning, you know that my favorite candidate is Princeton's own Paul Volcker. Uh, I think there is nobody in the world uh, that has, well, let's put it this way. There is nobody else in the world that I would entrust $700 billion to. <laughs> if it's in Paul Volcker's hands, I feel good about it. Uh, Professor Blinder, you uh, left the impression, at least to me, that Ho Xin could avert it if they did not leave Lemon when under. Is that what you really believe? No. Or something else will pop up? No. Uh, I, I don't believe that. First of all, we were already pretty deep in the soup on September 14th. So even if we had saved a Lehman, um, that would by no means have um, solved all the other problems that we have been fighting with for 13 months uh, previously. What I meant to say is two things. First of all, that the what you worry about most in a financial crisis is contagion. So this thing started with subprime mortgages. What we thought was a little corner of the mortgage market turned out to be a much bigger corner than we realized, and then it starts spreading from there out to this and that and the other thing. Uh, Lehman Day enormously increased the contagion, both in terms of types of markets and also in terms of geography. It went global, essentially, on Lehman Day. Um, the second thing that I meant to imply was, I think I said, well, I didn't, actually. I thought up through September 14th, well, this just shows how stupid I am, that we might actually skirt through this episode without having a technical recession defined as two negative GDP quarters in a row. That's the newspaper definition. I thought that was possible. I mean, it wasn't 100% probability, but I thought that was possible. On September 14th, the probability of that went to zero, September 15th. Uh, and as I said, the economy just fell off the table uh, in September. So it was those two things. So if Lehman had been done better, I think we would have lots of financial problems, but not as many, not quite as global, and a macroeconomic outlook that does not look nearly as bleak as it does now, but still was not good. Dr. Blinder. Um, right here. Now, you probably noted in your presentation that under the TARP, there's no requirement uh, for the banks to lend money. Uh, yesterday, Wells Fargo raised $11 billion, and the pro forma numbers show that in 2010, they'll have a 12% tier one capital ratio, which is a really high yeah. ratio, which means they're really hoarding capital. Do you think it's uh, appropriate to sort of 
regulate the banks in a manner that says that your tier one capital has to be somewhere between seven and eight percent so that they actually do lend money? I don't. I don't. Uh, your, your point is well taken, and I just am, amplify it a, mo a moment. If I was the head of a major bank right now and the government gave me more capital, I'd hoard it. And that's exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Recession, yes. Sure yes. That, that's why I think I pretty strongly suggested that we should have made it a requirement for banks that take this public capital to increase their lending. You asked a different question. Wells Fargo is one of the banks that didn't really want the capital. I would not force them to take it. I would not force them to eat down their capital to lower levels if their business judgment was it should be 11% or whatever they think, but they wouldn't be getting any public monies. So I'm saying the ones with the public money, should they have some sort of capital? I would make it a lending requirement if I had my druthers. Yeah. Professor Blinder, uh, one question that I have for you is what would you what advice do you have for um, revenue forecasters who are very, very challenged at this time as to when would things turn around? I, I know that outlook is bleak. Uh, we are assuming that, you know, we are in recession, it's deep, things like that. But what factors, because you said we were in the EMS mode, so what exactly would could turn around business and consumer confidence and, and okay. at some ray of hope? Right. Okay, so the, some of the things you want to watch are the gradual healing of the uh, financial system. Uh, it does look to be healing a bit, but LIBOR rates and TED spreads and OIS spreads and all that stuff look like they're getting better and not worse. Now, we've seen this before in this crisis, they get better and then something happens, they get worse, but uh, you certainly want to monitor that. You want to monitor especially carefully bank lending for just the reasons of this gentleman's uh, question if the banks really go into a shell, uh, it's going to be longer and deeper. You want to monitor the, and this will be easy because it will be very public, the size and nature of the fiscal stimulus. Uh, my guess, and uh, Speaker Pelosi more or less said this uh, yesterday, is that it's going to be a one-two punch stimulus. There will be something small passed in the lame duck session this month uh, that President Bush will not veto. Uh, we all have to remember we only have one president at a time. Uh, and then something bigger uh, uh, in the early weeks, I hope, of the Obama presidency. That'll help. If it's done right, sensible things in the package and a large package, that will help shorten the recession. Uh, my guess right now is that we're probably looking at four and maybe five negative quarters in a row. The third and the fourth, that's already in the soup. This, well, fourth isn't in you. We're living in the fourth and it's gonna be bad. I think the first quarter is gonna be bad also. We're, and it's too near for any of these policies to have any much of an effect on the uh, first quarter. As you go further into 2009, policy decisions that we made last month, this month, next month, etc., start having uh, some effects. Uh, I'd be pleasantly surprised if we're out of negative territory by the second quarter of uh, next year. And to me, the quarter, it, if the question is when do we turn from negative, from decline to growth, uh, in my mental calculation, it's the third quarter of next year that's in play. But as the bad scenarios were still negative in the third quarter, the good scenarios were back to positive in the third quarter of next year. Uh, talking about TARP, given the, uh, the uncertainty about the value of the assets that were at risk here, uh, my questions are, number one, where did the $700 billion figure come from? <laughs> and secondly, uh, can we have any confidence that, that, that that's the right number? Is it possible that it's twice that that will be necessary to, uh, yeah. to do what you've suggested? Yes. Uh, the, I, I can answer the qu first question, I think, with no fear of contradiction, which was, was pulled out of the air. Uh, uh, I'm quite confident in that. 
in that answer. Uh, the second one is a harder question, because you've asked the question, how much money would have to be devoted to this purpose, to the, to the stated top purpose, uh, to really uh, start pulling these markets out of the doldrums? Um, I don't know the answer to that. Nobody knows the answer to that. This is where the vultures and the bottom fishers come in. My hope, and I did, by the way, support the original purpose of the TARP. I, I'm one of the few people left in America, I think, that still thinks it's a good idea, uh, even though I can't answer your question. Uh, but the hope was always that by taking the lead and providing some buying power into these markets where there is now none, you induce private money to come in alongside you. And that private money will be, in, a good, in the good scenarios, vastly larger than the government's money. There are trillions of dollars sitting on the sidelines, worried, waiting to be deployed into something. You have assets, MBS and things like that, priced basically consistent with almost all the mortgages going into default. Uh, that won't happen. When it didn't even happen in the 1930s, and it's not going to be as bad as the 1930s. So at some point, and I, and I wish I knew when or where, and of course I don't, a large amount of private capital will start thinking, you know, this asset that the government is now buying for 27 cents on the dollar ought to be, at the end of the day, worth 54 cents on the dollar. Not 100 cents on the dollar. Never, never. If enough people controlling enough money start having beliefs like that, the amount that the government's money will be a drop in the bucket compared to the private money that will come in. That has not happened yet. Is there a question over that way? We only have time for one more. If not, we Is there a linearity in the time for deleveraging, which we all have been talking about, and uh, between linear deleveraging and then the return of new lending. And do you got any perspective on the amount of time? Um, I don't have a perspective other than to say it's going to be a while. Uh, there's a lot of deleveraging that needs to be done. Fortunately, this is the good news, not so much in the banking system. In the shadow banking system, so to speak, including the investment banks, some of whom are now posing as banks, uh, there needs to be a huge amount of deleveraging, and it's not over. I mean, if, if you're running Morgan Stanley or Goldman Sachs or something like that, and you want to get leverage down from 30 to 1 to 12 to 1, that's a big job. It's going to take you a long time. But the banks, the real bank, bank banks, you know, uh, have been at 10, 11, 12 to 1. They don't really have to deleverage. What they have to have is some confidence that if they lend money, they might get it back. So as the confidence gets restored, uh, I, I don't, we don't have that parallel deleveraging problem in the regular banking system. Now, as the gentleman over there suggested, a number of the banks are going beyond to even lower leverage than they often work at. So if they, they may work at 12 to 1 leverage and they've shrunk to 8 to 1 leverage, but that's because they're scared. And as the scare lifts, they can go back to 12 to 1 leverage. Please join with me in thanking uh